Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm Dr. Dorothy Escribano, Provost and Senior Vice President for Academic Affairs. May I ask you to please remain standing. By the authority vested in me by the President of the College and in respectful exercise of that authority, I hereby commence tonight's academic convocation at the College of New Rochelle. For the invocation, I call on Father Gregory Chisholm, Pastor, Church of St. Charles Borromeo, Chapel of the Resurrection, followed by the singing of the Star Spangled Banner, led by student Dominique Smith, class of 2018. We gather this evening <clears throat> in humble tribute to those remarkable women and men, our American forebears who protested, who marched, who petitioned, who appealed, to those outstanding wives and husbands, parents and grandparents of our nation who disobeyed who sat in, who refused, who held on. To those sainted servants of our country's progress who bore the heat of the day, who suffered, who lost, and who died. This evening, we stand respectfully for all those who gave so completely of themselves in order that we might have and we might live. Both the towering figures of black American history and the inspired heroes of women's history. How symbiotically do those strains of America's history of liberation meet in the person of Merle Evers Williams. Let us ask God's blessing on us tonight and on Mrs. Evers Williams. Please bow your heads. Lord God, we praise you and we bless you tonight because we are indeed wonderfully made. You have given us hands to bear the burden of building a nation. Through you, our God, we have minds capable of conceiving systems of true justice for this country that would ensure equal treatment, fair treatment to all our citizens. It is you, O oh God, who has endowed us with a Holy Spirit, orienting the heart of this nation to the creator of all humankind, we thank you that we are so gifted a people, even though our refusal to build a nation for all our citizens has often been legendary, even though our resistance to ensuring justice for all has been an embarrassment at times to our ideals, and even though our hearts have too often been hardened against you, the Creator. We thank you that you have always sent among us teachers and prophets and visionaries to stand in the gap, calling us back from the brink of self-destruction. They have thrown themselves into the defense of our highest American ideals, often giving their lives so that we might be salt for the earth, so that we might be a city on the hill for humankind. Give your blessing to your people assembled for this convocation of students, faculty, leaders, and friends at the College of New Rochelle. Pour down your generous blessings this evening on Merle Evers Williams, teacher, mother, wife, woman, servant, 
who has carried our burdens and who has ensured our foundations, giving what she loved most for the sake of this world so that we might live in freedom and justice humbly before you. Guard her in every way and grant her your peace. We ask this in the name of our Lord, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Ladies and gentlemen, the president of the College of New Rochelle, Judith Huntington. That is a tough act to follow. Please be seated. Thank you. Wow. Welcome to the College of New Rochelle. I am delighted to have you join us for this special academic convocation as we honor and pay tribute to the impactful life of Merle Evers Williams. Today we celebrate both Black History and Women's History Month, and the splendor of the college's mission bound by the Ursuline's steadfast devotion to education, women's leadership, social justice, and service. It was the Ursulines who founded the College of New Rochelle more than 112 years ago, based on the teachings of St. Angela Marici, a woman of vision, sacrifice, and dauntless perseverance, who boldly challenged the conventions of 16th century society to respond to the changing needs of her times. In founding the College of New Rochelle, the Ursulines inspired that zeal for progressive change through a vision that combines faithfulness and courage. Please join me in welcoming Sister Jane Finnerty, the Provincial of the Eastern Province, and all of the Ursulines that are here with us this evening.
I extend greetings to all of you on behalf of the Board of Trustees, especially the Chair of the Board, Ms. Elizabeth Bell Lavaca. I welcome special guests and extend personal greetings to Julissa Gutierrez, Deputy Director, Director of Constituencies Affairs for the Office of the Governor. I welcome our State Senator, Andrea Stewart Cousins, and Assemblywoman Shelley Mayer. Previous recipients of the college's honorary degree honor us with their presence. I welcome Brother Tyrone Davis, Director of the Office of Black Ministry of the Archdiocese of New York. I welcome Elza Dimwitty Boyd, former Dean of the College's School of New Resources. And finally, to our highly energized and extraordinary team of Vice Presidents, Deans, faculty, instructional staff, students, and staff, welcome. For 112 years, the College of New Rochelle has been an innovative, dynamic, contemporary, and values-based institution that has nurtured the personal and intellectual advancement of more than 50,000 women and men. Committed to its Ursuline values, the College remains steadfast in its dedication to women's education, the liberal arts, and to providing quality, affordable access to higher education to populations that have been previously overlooked. At the College of New Rochelle, our students are educated through an ethical lens that focuses on moral conviction and the refusal to ignore social injustices. Our mission explicitly states that, with justice as its guiding principle, the college tries to respond to the needs of society through its educational program and service activities. And it obligates us to respond. For our students, the educational journey is a transformative experience. For our society, CNR graduates bring about, tr bring about transformative change and meaningful impact. We attune students to global concerns, the dignity of people, the value of integrity, and the promotion of the common good. We have a special commitment to be attentive to issues of peace and justice and to act according to conscience. At CNR, we review this, review this responsibility through a very special lens in which all of God's people are part of one human family in solidarity with one another. And each life is cherished and possessed with inherent dignity and basic human rights. Tonight, I greet our special guest and candidate for honorary degree, Merle Evers Williams. Merle Evers Williams is an exemplary woman of extraordinary courage, perseverance, and fortitude. Her unwavering commitment to civil rights and equality is epitomized by her activist role to further human rights. A native of Vicksburg, Mississippi, Murley was an outstanding student at Alcor AMN College, where she met and married Megger Evers. Working alongside her husband, the couple witnessed firsthand the poverty and injustice imposed on African Americans. Determined to make a difference, Medgar and Murley opened and operated the first NAACP Mississippi State Office. Although they received constant threats against their lives, the Evers remained steadfast in their convictions, working diligently to secure voting rights, equality, justice, and dignity for all. Medgar Evers was assassinated outside their family home on June 12, 1963. Murley and their three small children witnessed the murder. Undeterred, Murley led the Evers family to justice. 31 years later, Murley was present in the courtroom when the guilty verdict and life imprisonment was levered on Megger's assassin. Recognizing the power of education, Murley received a Bachelor of Arts degree in sociology from Simmons College and has since 
then been awarded 17 honorary degrees. She was elected to the esteemed position of chair of the NAACP and established the Megger Evers Institute, where she also serves as chair. It is now my privilege to welcome to the podium a woman who models the very same values which have animated this college for 112 years, another woman of vision, sacrifice, and dauntless perseverance, and a change agent of her time, ladies and gentlemen, Merle Evers Williams. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you. To the President, trustees of the College of New Rochelle, I stand before you deeply honored for the honor that you bestow upon me. On a personal level, I have a very dear friend, someone that I call a daughter, who made me aware of this college. I'm sure that I must have read something about it along the way. But she told me how important the work of this institution is and how many people, of course, including the students, learn so much about the humanness of mankind and how they can take that learning into their different communities, into their homes, and to help build a better and stronger America. I said, hmm, I'd like to know a little bit more about that college. I was overpowered with information. <laughs> and when I was asked to be the speaker tonight, I said, I don't think so, I don't think so. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you for this honor that you bestow upon me. I am not in full dress. It's a little difficult to put on everything when you have a massive, unrelenting, mindset of one's hair. <laughs> so here I am, not in full attire, but in full attire as far as the heart is concerned. I'm absolutely like, delighted and honored to be here with you this evening. When we think of people who have given so much in life and the building of America, I feel personally that I would like to honor each and every one. So how do we do that? If you have that same feeling, you digest what those people have done, what they felt, what they believed in, and you take a small amount of that and you put it into your own life and into your own endeavors. And I gather that is what has been done at this college. And many colleges throughout this nation, as we pay tribute, particularly at this time of our lives, a people in the civil rights movement, some who had not in it ever finished grade school, let alone college, but had a sense of justice 
a sense of equality, a sense of being an American, even though their forefathers were brought here against their will. But you think of those people. I think of my country. This is my country. And no one, no one can take that from me. They cannot take it from me because I will not allow it. And we have so much to say about the direction of America if we hold on to what this country is supposed to be and not let it slip out of our hands through an imperfect political process. The fact that we have the freedom of speech, along with all of the other freedoms, says so much for this country because we can speak our minds. But more than that, we can act on those thoughts. And regardless of the ills of America, there are enough strengths in this country and in the hearts and minds and dedication of the people, regardless of race, creed, or color, how they feel about nurturing this country and seeing it move forward. I say to you, my friends, we are in, shall I say, a tough place right now? America, as I think most of us have known it, is being challenged. Who are we? What are we? What are we going to do? Which direction are we going in? What do we teach our children? Those in kindergarten, those on through high school, those in college, what is the job? An institution of higher learning. What is the job of this college? Do we have people who are dedicated to telling the truth? Do we have people who present the challenge of what we are, the many aspects of who we are and what we do? Do we have the people who are highly trained, who have us delve into the mysteries of this country? Well, I say to you, it's all of the above and more. I like to think, and I must feel, that the College of New Rochelle is doing its job, doing its job to build the minds and the hearts of people, whether they are young students, some who might be returning back to college, as I did, are the old ones. Old is not quite a good word, is it? But the senior ones. Ye gods, I fit into that category. <laughs> but that's all right. But to take the minds to stimulate people to think, to research, rethink, to operate sometimes outside of the system, but to think the process of who we are, what we can do, and the direction in which we are going. I stand before you tonight very thankful, believe it or not, for all of the things that have happened in my life. It has not been a life without difficulty. It has not been a life that's been easy. It has been a life of determination. It has also been a life of dealing with one of the most destructive things that we can think of, and that's hatred. How do we overcome 
that spirit of hatred that can grab us and turn us around and make us do things we never thought that we would do. But there's a song, a song that was sung over the years, Something Within Me. There may be some of you who know that. Something within me that holds back the strain. Something within me, and these are not the exact words I'm substituting here, that help me look at what is happening in life around me, to be sure to take advantage of all of the educational institutions and what they have to deliver to us. That something within that says there is a term called justice. Something within me that says I must fight for that. Something within me that says all of us in this country deserve to have a bit of justice within our lives. Then the question becomes, what are you willing to pay? What are you willing to do to see that justice prevails in all of our lives? What do you do when you see children who are hungry, poorly clothed, or running loose in their communities without anyone to pay any attention to them? For those going up through school, and you realize that some of them are not getting the education that they need. I don't need to list all of the problems that we have in this country because I would guarantee you 100% of you here know about them all, some way or the other. But I get back to the question, what do we do about it? You are developing leaders to come out of this institution qualified and hopefully with heart to move this country forward. I was asked by a group of people, how do you feel about America? There's been enough damage in your family to make you despise it. And my answer was, at one point in time I did. But I found that the anger and the hatred did more to hold me back than the fight to go forward and help make change in this country of ours. And I say to you without getting too political, We are at a point in America where we must take our freedoms seriously. We can no longer think this is a part of the Constitution. These are the laws and everything will be all right. I hope, I trust, I pray that perhaps in a couple of years I'll be able to visit this campus again Perhaps not even with the cane. But if I have to have two canes, that's all right. <laughs> the momentum will be there. And I hope we will, as a country, have looked deep into our hearts, have done some soul searching, and we get back to the basis of what this country was built on. Justice and equality for all people. That we will find our young people rushing to the doors of this institution and others to learn, to give back, and to make America as great as she can be. My life has been one of a continuous blessing, even though there have been times in my life when I thought I simply can take no more. 
But being reared by a grandmother who always said, never give up the faith. You get in there and you work for it. It has helped me to hold on. The man that I married who said, this is my country. I believe in my country and I will do whatever is necessary to make it open to all of the people and especially my people here. My friends, when you go through that kind of nourishment and conviction about things, I don't care how tough the road is, you simply stand a little taller and you say, I have been called. Not necessarily to stand out front, but called to do the very best I can for my family and for my country. And education is such a key component in that. I will tell you, I am as human as the next person. There have been periods in my life when I have felt the hatred of Satan and it seemed to stimulate me a little, to hit back, to do more. But interestingly enough, it all took a positive change. And that's what we're looking for in this audience and the students who matriculate here, for those people in the communities who feel like they are homeless, they are helpless, and no one cares, that we can and we must make America what America once was. A land of the free, a home of the brave, not just for some, but for all. I have no idea the number of days that I have left on this planet, but I want to be able to say, oh my good heavens, well lived. I haven't missed out on a thing. I may have had the material things, but all of the emotional things have been there for the taking and for the making. I believe it is that kind of strength, that kind of, may I call it wisdom, a commitment that will make us go forward. Medgar Evers gave his life so totally and so completely. And for a while I was very angry with him because I felt he put all of that ahead of me and ahead of our children. And one day he sat and he listened to my complaints and he looked at me and he said, don't you understand, I am doing this for you and my children and all of the other people who make up this nation and who make up this world. And he added, if I don't, who will? Yes, there are many out there who will. But he felt it was his mission to give all that he had so that we could achieve justice and equality and a decent education for everyone, that we would have a chance to be able to register and to vote, that we would be able to do all of the list of things that America says she promises to her citizens. And I asked the question, why you? And the answer came back, why not me? And I said, you know what the cost will be. Do you really love me? You're going to sacrifice yourself for this? And he looked at me and he said, it is for you and our children that I am willing 
to make the sacrifice. My friends, sometimes we are put in places and with people that we may not understand at first. But it's something about the strength of others that we get, that we can move forward. And if, if all possible, be highly educated in the areas of which we choose to direct our lives. For those of you here at this institution of higher learning, you are blessed to have it. You are blessed to be able to support it. And may the College of New Rochelle continue to be successful, continue to grow, continue to impact and shape the lives of others who will follow. I have been angry. I have been filled with hatred. I have wanted vengeance of the worst kind. But coming from a home where grandmother prayed daily, I learned how to plug in to whatever that was that she was sending out to me. I stand before you tonight saying how thankful I am to be a recipient of a degree from the College of New Rochelle. I stand before you tonight saying how blessed I am to have been born in this country. I stand before you tonight saying how blessed I was to have known a man such as Medgar Evers and to have been the mother of his children. I stand before you tonight saying that many times I did not think I could take it. And going back to an old spiritual have said, here I am. Lord, send me. And I know that there has to be one or two of you who know that song and who have carried on. Because life does not stop when you want it to. It may not be what you want it to. But somewhere linked in all of that, there's a spirit that says believe that says stand tall, speak your peace, do what you must do to bring about strength, wisdom, unity in this country and in this world. And for those who have gone through these gates, I have no doubt that you have found that feeling. For those of you in this audience, I want to think that each and every one of you have too. No one said it's going to be easy. But with a college like the College of New Rochelle, you have an opportunity here on campus and in this community to take advantage of the best education possible. I say seize it even if you happen to be over 65 years of age, go back, learn, challenge the system, be happy, be angry, fight, whatever is necessary to keep it alive, to stimulate yourselves and go into your communities and do what you should do, and I don't have to tell you what that is, because you know. We are in all of this together. I'm fortunate to have had the education that Mississippi provided. I'm fortunate to have gone on to other institutions of higher learning 
Oh, I don't want you to think that I've been through five or six or seven, I haven't. But those that I have to learn and to grow. And may we never stop learning. May we never stop growing. May we never cease embracing peace and goodness and hope of mankind. Because after all, my friends, that is what it's all about. Thank you. The college will now confer an honorary degree. I'd like to invite Gwen Adolf, incoming chair of the Board of Trustees, to the podium to introduce our honorary degree recipient. Good evening. For her deep faith and fearless struggle for equity for all people, for her decades as a courageous and tenacious leader in the quest for justice and fairness, for serving as a determined and valiant advocate for the collective voice of tens of thousands, for possessing remarkable wisdom, bravery, temperance, and commitment for the betterment of mankind. President Huntington, for Murley Evers Williams, I request that you confer the degree Doctor of Humane Letters, Honoris Causa. It is my privilege on behalf of the college community to verify that this candidate exemplifies in her life and achievements the highest ideals of the College of New Shell. I respectfully request that you confer on this candidate the honorary degree requested. By the virtue of the authority of the Regents of the University of the State of New York, vested in the Board of Trustees of the College of New Rochelle, and by them delegated to me, I confer on this candidate the honorary degree Doctor of Humane Letters and admit her to all the rights and privileges pertaining thereto. Congratulations, Merle. I invite Julissa Gutierrez from the Office of Governor Andrew Cuomo to the podium. Good evening. It's an honor to be here, such a pleasure to be with you in this room to celebrate Women's History Month, Black History Month, and the honorary degree to the Honorable Merle Evers Williams. So thank you so much. And I have a message on behalf of Governor Cuomo, who unfortunately couldn't attend tonight's event, but we do want to recognize her contributions. And I'll be reading a few excerpts from the citation and then presented on our behalf. State of New York, Executive Chamber Citation. Whereas the Empire State is proud to recognize citizens who have distinguished themselves through their extraordinary achievements which reflect their commitment to the progress and advancement of humanity, and so that we join to pay tribute to Merle Ever Williams as she is recognized with the conferral of an honorary degree by the College of New Rochelle, and for her contributions to the betterment of society in New York and the United States. And whereas smart, tireless, and determined, Merle's jobs included initiatives where she would make a positive difference in people's lives, 
breaking down barriers, and removing obstacles on the path to full equality. Where she was the first black woman to head the Southern California Democratic Women's Division and the first black woman named to the Los Angeles Board of Public Works. In 1976, she married Walter Williams, a union activist, and together they continued to serve the civil rights cause and the African American community until his death in 1995. Murley made history the same year as she became the first woman to take over the reins of the NAACP, and she turned the troubled organization around in just three years, putting it back on its feet, ensuring its relevance for generations to come. And whereas Murley Evers Williams is known as a civil rights activist, an author, a lecturer, an educator, a journalist, a politician, and a pioneer in the truest sense of the word, breaking new ground in the history of the United States, setting a standard of courage and determination as an inspiring symbol of the triumph of the human will and intellect. A woman who has come to earn the respect and admiration of generations of people around the world. As a mother and a grandmother, she has altered the future for those who will follow her by tuning her core values, beliefs, and ideas into actions and initiatives that have benefited humankind as a whole. And now, therefore, I, Andrew M. Cuomo, Governor of the State of New York, do hereby confer this citation upon Murley Evers Williams on the occasion of today's academic convocation and conferral of an honorary degree at the College of New Rochelle, signed by Andrew Cuomo, Governor, March 3rd, 2016. Thank you. Thank you, Jalissa. And now for our musical interlude. The college community is extremely excited to present an amazingly accomplished musician and artist. This Grammy Award winning R&B artist has graced, graced such stages as Lincoln Center, the Apollo Theater, among many others, and will share his great gift with us tonight. Please welcome the dynamic and multi-talented Mr. Bravon Neal. is weary when troubles come and my heart burden be then I am still and wait here in silence until you come and sit a while with me.
no life without its hunger. Each restless heart beats so imperfectly. But when you come, my soul is filled with wonder. Pavan, thank you. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, this academic convocation will conclude with the benediction led by Brother Tyrone Davis, Director, Office of Black Ministry, Archdiocese of New York, and esteemed trustee of the College of New Rochelle, with, uh, followed by the singing of the alma mater led by student and Amanda Malone's class of 2019. The words of the alma mater are printed in your program. I ask that you please remain in your seats following the alma mater until the stage party has processed off the stage, followed by the deans and the faculty. We then invite you to join us for light refreshments in the castle parlors once the parties have completed the procession. Now I am pleased to call on Brother Tyrone Davis to offer the benediction. Good evening. For those who wish, I invite you to please stand. First of all, I, I bring you uh, greetings and best wishes uh, from our archdiocese, especially our 
our black Catholic community of this archdiocese and from our Archbishop, Cardinal Dolan, who regretfully could not be with us this evening. As we bring this beautiful day to a very prayerful conclusion, we are so mindful that our God, we are mindful that our God in the spirits of so many great men and women who have gone before us marked with the sign of faith have been with us throughout this day. We certainly know that the spirits of St. Angela Marici and St. Catherine Drexel and St. Josephine Bakita have been with us and are with us, and for that we are truly grateful. But we're also mindful of the great women, women of vision who are with us today. Women like our Ursuline sisters, our president, President Judith Huntington, and especially our honoree, Dr. Murley Evers Williams, and we are truly grateful. How good it is for us to be in the presence of the Lord and in the presence of greatness, especially great women. We thank you, Lord, and we give you praise. And so let us pray. For all your many blessings to us, for your goodness and mercy to us, we thank you, O God. In every circumstance of life, in good times and bad, we trust you, O God. In love and faithfulness, with all that we have and all that we are, we serve you, O God. As we speak and listen to those in our world, near and far, especially those most in need and without a voice, we share your love, O God. In our plans and works for ourselves and for others, for justice and peace in our world, we glorify you, O God. In our every thought, word, and deed, by the power of your Holy Spirit, and as we leave this place, may we live for you and praise you, O God. And now I invite you to continue this prayer with me as together we sing. everyone. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye Let us go in peace.